Welcome back to the lecture series on bioenergetics of life processes. So, in the last class, I was talking to you about the concept of two photosystem and how it was discovered. I believe when I was kind of closing in, there was a little bit of confusion which was there. So, let me just uh, reiterate that point before I start this class. So, what we essentially discussed is, say for example, so what was the experiment? Experiment was done like this at what wavelength photosynthetic efficiency is highest. How are we going to measure it? It is very simple. Say for example, you have a source beam of light. So, we know if you take a beam of light, you have all these uh, spectrum. So, you take a put a prism or you see a rainbow, okay, violet, indigo, blue, yellow, orange, red. Okay. So, as you go all the way down to orange or red or something, the wavelength increases. Your lambda increases, right? And the frequency of course, decreases because and if the frequency is higher, it will be high energy E is equal to H nu, right? E energy, H is a Planck's con constant in nu and E is equal to H 1 by lambda, right? Because energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So, if the wavelength increases, energy decreases, right? Similarly, if the frequency increases, energy increases. So, at a lower wavelength, like wavelengths of violet, indigo like where you see something like this if the light is something like one second let me okay like suppose the light is coming like this so these these have very high frequencies so automatically the energy of such light is very high something like the uvs and all this okay whereas when you talk about wavelength like this okay as compared to this situation here e prime energy will be so, energy E will be more than E prime, okay, because here lambda will be higher. So, if I see the, so I say lambda, so lambda which is the wavelength, so lambda prime will be greater than lambda. Similarly, if we talk about nu and the nu prime, so you will see nu will be, the frequency will be higher than nu prime. So, there is an inverse relation which continues out here. So, you can further increase it like this. Okay. So, here your lambda will be further higher than lambda prime. So, if we talk about the lower wavelengths, those are the ones which are having higher energy. So, what the experiment which was done is to see at what wavelength of light. So, I have say violet, wave, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. At what wavelength of light you will get a higher quantum efficiency in terms of photosynthesis, oxygen evolution. Now, it was observed that if you give, if you really see, if you see the graph, so you give a 400, you get this much, 520 this much, 600 this much, 680 this much, okay, at different level. But if you go all the way out here, you see there is a drop. What was observed is, say for example, you couple, so if, we, if you remember, this is what is important for you to understand. If you give it separately, if you give it separately and you see the oxygen evolution here, you see the oxygen evolution here and you add up say some moles of oxygen what you are getting out here. Okay. Now, what you do? You couple both of them. So, you have a mixture of both these wavelengths and you get an oxygen out here quant uh, of mo mole of oxygen. You would see the oxygen which is evolved here is higher than oxygen evolved when these two are given separately. And that gives us a concept that possibly there are two different kind of sites where light is being absorbed uh, with different quantum efficiencies. And unless the you the plant is supplied with that kind of light mixture, you won't get the complete quantum efficiency of photosynthesis. Okay? So, this was what was the concept of a red drop. Okay. Now, coming back the photosystem 1 and for system 2. So, this was the discovery of for system 1 and for system 2 by Emerson and then this leads to the concept of photosystem 1 and 2 have complementary roles, complementary roles. Now, what are that? 
Now it was observed, now I will come to the Ford system 1 and Ford system 2's rule. So, here you have Ford system 1, say for example, Ford system 1, here you have Ford system 2 and here you have lambda less than 700 nanometer, which I was trying to tell you, okay. Uh, lambda which is higher, which is less than 680 nanometer. Okay. So, you have a mixture now, right? because beyond 680 nanometer, you would not find beyond 700 as, as you could see this drop happening. So, you are having a mixture. Okay. So, this one is kind of less than 700, which includes 680 and this one is less than 618. So, you have two different kind of light sources you are using. Okay. Now, this for system 1 generates and I will come to that two things. One, it generates a strong reductant. in the form of NADPH, whereas for system 2 on the contrary generates a strong oxidant in terms of oxygen and both of them generates a weak oxidant and a weak reductant. A weak reductant and a weak oxidant and the weak oxidant which was generated here is and weak reductant is your ATP adenosine triphosphate the real key molecule which is governing it. Now, this is NADPH. So, your byproducts are coming as NADPH, a strong reductant which is involved in CO2 to CH2O, strong reductant. You have ATP, which is your energy molecule, and you have the oxygen as the byproduct. And if photosystem 2 would have contained, so you can realize after looking at this, these two are complementary. And if you realize, so it seems photosystem 2. 2 is involved in the reaction what we talked about water splitting or hydrogen sulfur splitting which is generating either 2 S or O 2. If you go back to the previous class where I was yes look at this one. So, it is out here probably for system 2 where that kind of water splitting is happening or a hydrogen sulfide splitting is happening at Ford system 2. Okay. Of course, both of them produce a weak oxidant as well as a weak reductant in the form of ATP molecule. Okay. Now, coming back to what happened, Ford system, now we will talk about the whole architecture of Ford cysts. And if you remember, in the very beginning, I talked about the reduction potential or a redox potential. I told you that the redox potential is basically the ability of a X molecule to donate or accept electron. Of course, if you are going by the accepting electron series, then it is called the reduction potential. And if you go by the ability of oxidation or donation of electron and oxidation potential. And we are only dealing with the reduction potential because you have to. So, if I am comparing say A to Z, the different uh, molecules, then either I can compare by all of them on the basis of oxidation potential or all of them on the basis of reduction potential because you have to, you cannot interchange it. Okay. So, we will be dealing with all of them on, you know, in terms of the reduction potential. In other words, what is the energy it needed to generate an electron, okay? how much energy and that is what essentially distinguishes the different redox potential of different x, y, z elements which are present. Okay. So, 
talking about the redox, so what we will do now is if you go back uh, when I was drawing this, what I will be trying to do now, okay, now here. So, there are series of uh, series of molecules which are involved in photosynthesis in which are lying at photosystem 2, photosystem 1 and these are different membrane bound proteins which are there and they are arranged something like this and I will draw it further. So, each one of them have different redox potential. In other words, these proteins are arranged in such a way that each one of them have a different work function of donating electron or accepting electron. Okay? They can accept electron with very different efficiencies. So, say for example, if I have A which has more power to accept electron than B, so if I have a source of electron then A will be catching the electron faster as compared to B because A has more pull for the electron, more power to get reduced. Keep this basic, basic concept in mind that if I have 20 players and if you arrange them in an order that you know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H and assume that A has the highest power to accept electron. So, what will happen if I start dropping the electrons like this? So, A will be the one which will grab the maximum number of electrons till it is completely filled, then the B, then C, then D, then E, then all the way to Z. So, Z will be the least one. So, that helps them to arrange. So, in a, in a way, if I num name these proteins at A, B, C, D, E. So, what I can do is I can arrange them with a different redox potential. I can arrange them like this. So, we I can say that A has the highest power to accept an electron, B is the next, C is the third, D is the E and F likewise. And of course, there is another aspect which is in space how they are located. Okay? So, keep this concept in mind while I will be drawing a very interesting aspect of explaining photosynthesis in terms of the redox potential or the ability. <coughs> so, in terms of the redox potential, on my left hand, I will be drawing the redox potential in terms of the voltage. Okay? Redox potential in terms of voltage. Okay. Now, I will start with 0.8. Zero point six, zero point four, zero point two, zero, minus zero point two, minus zero point four, minus zero point six, minus zero point eight, minus one, minus one point two. 1 minus 1.4 likewise if I could really jack up the scale okay fine this is this is good enough for us to study okay so water uh, if I one second let me get the scale okay so water is sitting at 0.8 redox potential h2o okay so now out here the so, the way it works, before I kind of get into this graph, let me tell you how the whole thing works. So, you have for system 1, for system 2 and for system 1. So, light falls on both these for systems. Okay? And these for systems are what we talked about P680 and P700. Okay? This is the one which is activated at P680 and this is the for system 1 which is getting activated at P700. Now, what happens is that from here from the reaction center of chlorophyll one electron is getting ejected out. Okay. Once there is an electron which is ejected out the chlorophyll out here becomes devoid of an electron. Now, this electron is funneled through series of those proteins what I am trying to tell you reaches let us again rehash this. 
light falls at two photo systems h nu h nu from here an electron is ejected from here an electron is ejected so at this site site 2 and site 1 once the electron is ejected there are two chlorophyll molecules out here which are devoid of which are devoid of electrons now once they are devoid of electrons they are almost like free radical now the electron from here from this side too is funneled out here all the way to photosystem 1 and that electron which photosystem where it reaches photosystem 1 brings this chlorophyll back to its ground state okay whereas this electron is further utilized and it channels through to make what we talked about NADPH and this is used to create a proton gradient. We will come later into that. Okay. Now, on the contrary, so now you have already balanced out this chlorophyll. So, it is now back with, to its ground state. It went and it donated the electron and it received an electron from for system 2. Now, what happens? Out here still there is an electron which is left high and dry. Who takes care of that electron? Because that electron which is devoid of, so this chlorophyll molecule needs an electron to comes back, comes back to its ground state. Who helps it? That is helped by this wonderful molecule which is water or it could be H2S which supplies the electron to this chlorophyll to bring it back to its ground state. So, essentially you observe there is what I was trying to tell from the beginning that there will be one molecule who will be a perennial electron donor. So, this whole potential drop will only be maintained when you have one donor that one poor fellow who will be continuously donating electron and through billions of years the history is all about the chemical evolution is all about who is that player who will be an electron donor. It is believed there was an earth where that key player was hydrogen sulphide and today we live in a world where that key player is water. Who is that perennial source of electron? So, to summarize or before I put the redox potential in place. So, you have two photosystems, light falling on both the photosystems, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. Both have reaction centers of chlorophyll, what I have explained in the previous class. The chlorophyll energy is funneled to the reaction center. So, one chlorophyll molecule gives away the electrons. So, once it gives away the electron, there are two chlorophyll which are left high and dry out there who has to be brought back to their ground state. Now, the electron which has been given out by photosystem 1 is being brought back by the electron which travels through or not travels through which kind of hops through from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1 and brings it back. So, photosystem 1 is now quiet, but what will happen to photosystem 2? It also has a chlorophyll molecule which has to be brought back to its ground state. So, that needs an electron because finally that electron energy is being utilized to synthesize your NADPH and creating a proton gradient. How you work out that logic and that logic is being worked out by that perennial electron donor. So, that is what I am trying to highlight from the beginning of the course that it is all about that one perennial electron donor and as long as you have that perennial electron donor at your disposal and you have a way to extract the electron from that perennial donor, you do not have to worry. That one electron donor will always be sitting somewhere out here who will be you know giving the electrons and as long as that perennial electron donor keep on giving the electron, 
your energetics of life machinery will run. And in this case, that perennial electron donor is your water. So this electron, so water getting split. So photosystem 2 is where water is getting a split. So essentially, photosystem 2 has two functions. The first function is it absorbs light and led to the evolution of a uh, uh, of an electron from the reaction center of chlorophyll. The second reaction what happens, it splits water and brings back that chlorophyll molecule which is away from its ground state at a higher energy state upon losing an electron. On the other hand, photosystem 1 does the job of producing NADPH, a very powerful reductant which is involved in CO2 to CH2O reaction, which is more of a biochemical reaction of the dark reaction what we talk about. So this part of photosynthesis is all about light reaction and that part of photosynthesis is all about the dark reaction or the Kelvin cycle. So now in the light of this, I will draw the redox graph which will help you to appreciate photosynthesis from, yes, this was the reason why I was waiting for it. Okay. So, this is where water is sitting. So, photosystem 2 has a unique cluster called manganese cluster and we will talk more about it soon. These manganese cluster is the one which traps the water molecule in its belly and split it up into oxygen and creates a proton gradient and that proton gradient has its own significance. So what this manganese cluster is doing? This manganese cluster is involved in evolving oxygen, so it is taking the water molecule and creating an oxygen plus uh, it leads to a proton gradient. So this is where the whole manganese cluster is involved in water splitting reaction. And this manganese cluster donate it to another molecule which is something like a Z which is one good electron acceptor which can accept electron even at a much more efficiency than water and that Z molecule actually donates it, it to that reaction center which is P680. So I told you that there are two reaction centers in photosynthesis. This is the one which is P680 which is photosystem 2 and P700 which is photosystem 1. So, P680 is that first center from where an electron is being ejected out whose uh, redox potential is very interestingly stand somewhere. Look at this picture, this is very interesting. It is almost, almost hitting out here. This is where P 680 chlorophyll molecules electron is being ejected out. So this is where the electron is being raised. It has a different redox potential and what is very important as I will come through, you will realize electrons are all same. They, have this, they belong to the same class called electrons, yet they have different redox potential and that is what the most beautiful part of biology. <laughs> they belong to the same root same cast of molecules called electrons, yet, yet they have a different redox potential. How is it so? And we will come to that in the next lecture where we will be kind of completing this uh, redox potential map. There we will kind of realize how electrons emitted out from different photosystems behaves differently. Thank you.